to you by the McKenzie Global Institute in partnership with CNBC Africa. Has Africa's growth run out of steam? This question is on the minds of many investors, business leaders and policymakers as they observe the effects of low resource prices and higher levels of socio-political instability on the continent's GDP. I'm Bronwyn Nielsen and with me is a distinguished panel, panel and a studio audience to get insight into McKinsey Global Institute and McKinsey Africa's latest report. Lions on the move to realizing the potential of Africa's economies. In Johannesburg are Acha Leke, senior partner at McKinsey and Company, Trevor Manuel, former South African finance minister, Vera Songwe, IFC director for West and Central Africa, and Andrew Darfour, group CEO of Alexander Forbes. And in the Lagos studio, we are joined by Charles Key, managing director and CEO of Ecobank Nigeria. Thank you all very much for joining me. Acha, I'm going to ask for context from a McKinsey perspective on the report that has just been released. Thank you, Bronwyn. Um, very excited to release the report today. As you know, uh, we released the first report about five years ago, and a lot has changed on the continent since then. So what we thought we would do is really get a fact-based perspective on what's been happening. Uh, a lot of questions are asked about Africa rising. Is it real? Is it not? And we thought instead of being subjective, let's really get the facts. So a couple of messages that came out of the report. One is on the growth. The growth um, has slowed down, but it's a lot more divergent and nuanced than it was in the past, right? So you still have a number of countries that are growing. 40% of, of the countries in Africa are still growing, even though growth has been dragged down by the oil exporters and the Arabian countries. But if you look forward and you look at you know, what's really happening uh, below the surface around the consumer spend, around urbanization, we're the fastest growing, fastest urbanizing region in the world, around technology and how it's transformed uh, many sectors already and the potential for it to continue to do that, we remain very confident about the growth going forward. So that was the first message. Second then is about the business opportunities and resize in this case, not just the consumer, but also the, the business B2B opportunity. And again, huge opportunities for, com for companies across the continent, <coughs> and, but that's shifting. So the consumer shift is very interesting. South Africa, for example, where we are, used to account for 15% of, of consumption in Africa. That's going down to 12% per our projections over the next 10 years. Um, East Africa is actually at the expense of East Africa. That's growing quite fast. Whatever you say about Nigeria, Nigeria is still going to be more than 20% of consumption spend. You, know, you have to be in Nigeria. So a lot of shifts in, in, in the business opportunities, but they're real. The third is manufacturing. It's a um, sector that has underperformed, um, but today we manufacture $500 billion worth of products across the continent, and we believe that could be doubled. Um, a lot of things need to be done differently. We'll come back to that, but we think there's a huge potential. And a lot of that potential is actually manufacturing for our consumption. It's not about, it's not necessarily exports, but three quarters of that is manufacturing the goods that we need in the continent today because, uh, because of the fast growing consumption and business spend. Fourth is on the, on the corporates. Uh, we believe we've created the first database, uh, the most comprehensive of African corporates. And I always ask this question about, each time I say I have an audience, is how many companies do you think make a billion dollars or more in revenue in Africa? And I'm sure you're gonna give me the answer. <laughs> and I'll give you the answer because I wanna ask you the question, but typically people tell me 50 to 100, right? And the answer is 400 companies. And which is a significant which is upgrade significant from the, the 50 that people expect. Exactly. And obviously, the only two people who have got it right so far, Aliko Dangote being one of them. Very interesting. Well, it's good that we can have <laughs> Aliko Dangote a little later in our conversation as well. Exactly. So the 400 companies that make a billion dollars in Africa, they're, they actually are more profitable and they grow faster than the global peers. But the truth is, they're not enough. We need a lot more. We have no African company in the five, uh, Fortune 500 today. We need a lot more. And finally, then, what needs to be done about it? So we have recommendations both on the government side and on the, on the, corporate, on the corporate side. And uh, we didn't want to talk about everything that needed to be done. We said, look, if you just focus on a few critical things, what would that be? And, you know, it's not rocket science, but it has to be done. You know, mobilizing our own resources to fund our own development. Diversification. Diversification is absolutely critical. Actually, I think low pri oil price is good for our economies because it's going to force us, it forces us to do that. Uh, skills and a number of others. But, but underlying all of that is the quality of leadership in the public sector. Well, there's the context, lines on the move to Mr. Manuel, let's bring you in here. 
you network with a number of foreign investors on a regular basis and the mood out there, we've spoken that generally people are net negative at this point in time on Africa's potential. The report highlighting a number of opportunities in that you, you need to look through short-term troubles and focus on positivity. What, what is the mood out there with the investors that you are engaging with? Thank you, Bron. I think that uh, uh, the divergence is, is very encouraging. Uh, if, if one looks at uh, parts of the continent, East Africa, for instance, that, had not been, that hadn't produced a number of big players in the past, they're right there now. One looks at the changes in the country like Ethiopia, uh, Kenya, uh, Tanzania, uh, Uganda, and you begin to understand that uh, uh, the, the positivity uh, that Acha spoke of uh, about uh, uh, the silver lining to a low oil price, in fact, brings a num number of other countries into play, and, and but also uh, provides a boost to the manufacturing sector, as the report indicates and confirms, uh, as, as happened in, in Ethiopia. And so this, I think, is, 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 is one of the big challenges. I think that <coughs> Uh, there's not a pretty picture on the macro front at the moment. Uh, Africa's had uh, much stronger times. I think that, uh, that perhaps too many countries lived uh, high on the hog before 2008. Uh, and when commodity prices came off, uh, countries uh, couldn't maintain uh, the lifestyle that they had before that. And I think you're still seeing the residual effects of that across Africa macro. <coughs> the other issue, I mean, that, that is important is that these roll of the tongue narratives, Africa rising, 54 countries rising together, uh, is out of place. I think the divergence uh, confirms that it's out of place, that <coughs> there's a lot more nuancing that takes place, and I think we're seeing that. And there it's are going to be winners <coughs> and losers. There are going to be winners and losers, and I think you're seeing also uh, that there's still uh, pretty strong FTI flows, both. Uh, um, in, in, in terms of uh, aggregate, but also uh, in terms of rates. Uh, it's a very positive story. But Africa is a big continent, 54 countries, and we need to understand what the complexity is. Now, it also speaks to, to, to the issues that are at the heart of the report. Uh, better quality leadership, more engaged in macroeconomic management, more in, engaged in the development of talent, more focused on issues like regional economic integration and that very important aggressive diversification of the economy all make a lot of sense when one looks at trend lines across the continent. And I, I think that the trend lines since the first report in 2010, uh, which, which happened just in the wake of the Lehman Brothers collapse, uh, there now is a slightly different view of the world and I think it's important to take account of that. Charles, I want to turn my attention to you in Nigeria while we're talking macroeconomics and get a sense of what is developing in West Africa. A lot of territories having been hit by the fallout in resources and in particular the fallout around oil. And of course, Nigeria technically in a recession at this stage. What needs to be done to mitigate against that recession and to look forward to the prior growth opportunity that we've seen in West Africa as a whole? Well, I think what oil um, price has done um, to most of the uh, West African countries is to um, send a clear signal that most of our countries in Africa are still quite vulnerable to um, commodity prices changes. And one of the first lessons that most of the countries should actually draw from what we've seen over the last few months uh, or years actually is um, to um, uh, make sure there is a clear understanding of how prepared our countries are to absorb the various shocks that may come um, as a consequence of these volatility that we see uh, in commodity prices. Um, the second message that uh, the situation that we're going through uh, is also sending is that there is a clear need for diversification uh, in, in our economies. If you take a country like Nigeria, for instance, where more than 80% of uh, foreign currency uh, you know, uh, proceeds come from oil, 
uh, there is a need, uh, obviously, to move away from um, you know, a single commodity and therefore to dramatically diversify the economy looking at uh, other sectors that can not only uh, fuel the growth but also uh, bring the much needed uh, foreign currency and clearly um, manufacturing is uh, a, a, a sector that needs to be uh, particularly looked into and, uh, and obviously uh, uh, services at large, uh, but particularly financial services as well. well. While we're talking about West Africa, let's go back to Lagos where we catch up with Aliko Dangote, President and CEO of the Dangote Group. Right, let's begin by getting your views on the economic outlook for West Africa. Uh, Nigeria is facing a recession right now. In your opinion, what are the reasons for this and how long do you think it will last? If you look at uh, uh, West Africa, most countries in West Africa, despite the uh, economic challenges, uh, they are actually doing well, pretty well. I mean, you look at Cote d'Ivoire, uh, they are still at about 9.4 percent. You look at Ghana, you know, second quarter, 4.9 percent. Uh, you look at even Togo, Togo has gone up a bit by, you know, uh, from 5.1 to 5.8 percent. Uh, Benin Republic 5.2 percent you know so I can go on and on you know uh, uh, our own uh, you know is really a little bit uh, you know severe you know and I think one of the major problem what really cost it uh, you know 90 uh, percent of the government's foreign exchange adding is uh, from oil the only way for us to get out of this recession is by us to try and make sure that, yes, we move quickly into action. Uh, action by, you know, saying that, uh, you know, uh, we, we diversify the economy quickly. Uh, but I think the real challenge for us is now for us to have the political will in terms of selling some assets. Uh, I think it's an easier route than going to IMF or World Bank to borrow m money because what we need to do is actually to beef up the reserves. Uh, you know, I'm talking now particularly, you know, on, uh, you know, Nigeria. The new McKinsey report highlights some interesting points and it speaks to one, for instance, that doubling output over the next 10 years could add as many as 6 to 14 million jobs in Africa and I want to get your perspective on what you think governments and businesses should be doing today to accelerate industrialization on the continent. Well the, to accelerate the, uh, this thing you know uh, first of all the government what the uh, you know governments you know uh, they need to do this is not particularly in Nigeria is actually to work with the private sector and have an articulated industrial policy which uh, will make sure that, yes, you know, you have very good incentives. Uh, I know that some people in uh, government, they don't even understand what you call incentive because they take it as, okay, no, it's a way of just somebody taking money. No. I mean, today, for any company that we operate anywhere, especially in Africa, government earns more money by the time you take VAT, by the time, because you have to generate the economic activity or activities rather, for them to, to earn the value added tax. Okay, if you don't do that, they, I mean, it will be there. You have, uh, you know, withholding tax, you have corporate uh, tax in Nigeria, you even have uh, education tax. You have various taxes. So by the time you add all these taxes and you see what remains inside the company and what shareholders take as dividend you see that definitely, you know, government earns more money. Even when you declare a dividend, government earns 10%. You know, so in the McKinsey report, when you look at it, yes, the industrialization, manufacturing in particular, is what will actually create more than even the 10, six, they say 6 to 10. I believe it could be more. 
Well, there we go, Vera, industrialization and manufacturing, a key message coming out of Aliko Dangota. We've already spoken about the fact that there are going to be winners and losers when you look at the, the yeah. African context and the 54 countries that are on the continent. Let's get your sense now on the, the macroeconomic forecasts as you see them. We are going to now refer to a slide from the McKinsey report, which looks at Africa growth in the context of 3.3%. Um, and that being for the 2010 to 2015 period. So it's lower for longer as a given. Yes, I think uh, just to start off, uh, I want to say on the discussion of Africa rising and Africa stabilizing, the fundamentals in Africa are strong right now. There has been, I think, sufficient understanding of the importance of macroeconomic fundamentals on the continent. I think most countries have put that in place. Countries understand the needs for containing deficits, for containing debt to GDP levels. It is true that between the 2010 to 2015 period, debt levels have risen a little bit. We've seen a decrease in savings, which is normal. We've gone from 27% of savings to only 16%. But a lot of that, of that has happened on the back of good investments. Investments as a percentage of GDP, in particular for infrastructure, have gone up from about 1% to 3.5%. The report says they need to go to 4.5% for us to become much more competitive, particularly in the manufacturing sector, for example. FDI continues to come in. But I think when we talk about Africa now in the macro context, I, never before has it been quite evident that Africa is part of the global economic structure. I think even in 2010 and, and, and 2000 in particular, there was a discussion about is Africa part of this or is they decoupling? I think clearly what is happening in Africa now is a part of global headwinds, China, and of course the financial architecture and the financial environment which is tightening. But the tightening financial environment, even that with currencies, and we've just spoken about that when we hear about businesses, that when the currencies depreciate in the African continent, we should be more competitive. And I think this is where the last chapter of the report becomes quite important. We need to put in place regulatory and uh, a regula regulatory environment which is important for private sector to do business. And with this we see that Consistently now for the last five years, African countries have been the top t in the top 10 of the doing business report. So they're getting better at improving the business environment. They're improving the attractiveness of the continent and th we are getting a response to that. So my sense is the discussion on the 2010 to 2015 and then what is gonna happen after that is not a stagnation. Or I think we're ready and there has been resilience. Even in Nigeria, I think if you see the kinds of headwinds that they have had to face and the fact that they continue GDP to revenue, so domestic mobilization, mobilization of non-oil revenues has actually gone up from 13% in 2010 to 23%. So, so there, there are, I want to bring Andrew in here and again a, a big message coming through that private sector and government are going to have to work together and more importantly as Vera's just indicated government has to create that enabling environment. Let's get your thoughts obviously as a private sector voice weighing in from Alexander Forbes. Yeah no sure thank you Bronwyn and it's a pleasure to be here this morning. Um, I think anyone thinking of Africa has to take a very long-term view. Um, so if I think of the continent of Africa and you take a view to 2030, 2050, the demographics make sense. So ultimately, it's a, it's a continent of a billion people, give or take today. It will be two billion people by 2030, give or take. What that really means is that there's like to be about 1.4 million people um, working, and they're going to be very young. Um, probably under the age of 30, 35. Um, that really results in you know, poverty being shrunken down tremendously. So I think the trick is for getting government and private sector to work much more closer together. But I think it's based on a principle of being pragmatic as opposed to being ideological. I also think it's about creating the right conditions for governance. I also think it's about creating the right conditions for having open and honest dialogue. Um, but I think the fundamentals to that are really about education. I think the fundamentals are really about making sure there's a framework for good active debate. So, you know, a company like uh, Alexander Forbes, I mean, we, we are a financial service conglomerate, so we offer a range of solutions. So ultimately, when we think of the continent of Africa, it's our home, but we have to take a much broader term view. And I think ultimately, for us, they're likely to be winners and losers. Um, the winners are, you know, large hubs like Kenya, uh, like Nigeria, like South Africa. Um, there are other hubs in North Africa, like Morocco, but I think you have to take a broader view of Africa because... Not forgetting Cote d'Ivoire, which was indeed, mentioned by Aliko Dangote earlier in the discussion. Indeed, but you've got to take a much broader view because every country is different, it has different cultures and the like. 
We want to make this a pan-African discussion and to get the East African perspective on the report, let's look at this interview with Bob Carlymore, CEO of Safaricom, which is headquartered in Nairobi. Five years ago, Africa's growth was accelerating in almost all economies. But today we are looking at a very mixed picture. What is your outlook for the East African market? Well, I think that mixed picture I mean, is obvious because you have to stop thinking about Africa as being one entity. It's not. Uh, and what the last five years have shown us is that these economies are relying on different things. You know, the mineral-rich uh, economies like Nigeria, um, that over-reliance on one commodity uh, is causing them a problem. I think Kenya and uh, other parts of East Africa are luckier in the sense that they, um, that they didn't rely on oil uh, and they've got a slightly more diversified uh, economy, but I do think that it's much, it's very, very important that we diversify a lot more than we are today and, and not rely so much on agriculture and tourism, which we do here in Kenya. Yeah. Now, for Safaricom, what are some of the key factors that have driven your growth? Um, I think one of the big key factors is the fact that we've got, um, you know, the population dividend. So Kenya is growing at the rate of roughly a, a million a year, and if we take our natural share of that million a year, you can see that your customer base will grow. And then, of course, the technology itself adds a lot more utility and people are using it uh, a lot more. So we're seeing our average revenue per user uh, still on the incline. We're seeing a lot more people using data. Uh, and the interesting thing about ICT and technology in, in general, it is actually a great engine for growth. Now, um, the, the McKinsey report uh, sizes the the African consumer and business spending opportunity at $4 trillion. What should corporate Africa be doing today to tap this opportunity effectively? Well, I think the first thing that we need to do is we need to make more of our own stuff. So we need to stop importing as much food as we're importing. You know, Africa as a continent is importing about 30% of the stuff that we're, uh, we're eating, and, and we shouldn't. We should be the breadbasket of, um, of the world. So th that's the first thing. We need to, to really invest much more in, um, in agribusiness, not just in agriculture. I think we need to do a lot more of our own manufacturing. I mean, it was great news that um, recently uh, Volkswagen has announced assembly of, um, of their cars here in, in Kenya. Um, South Africa has done really well in terms of of assembling BMWs, for example. So we need to really get into manufacture. Well, of course, manufacturing, another key theme coming across Acha, and then also the agriculture element. We know well that Africa is home to 60% of the world's uncultivated arable land. We have to take agriculture seriously. But I also want to talk about the fact that by 2034, Africa will be home to the largest working age population bigger than India and China. 1.1 billion people targeted to be in that category come 2034. Absolutely. And uh, that creates a huge opportunity for us to, um, like we've seen, be the manufacturing base of the world, not just for export, but also for our domestic uh, consumption. But it's also a risk, right? We need to make sure that the, these, uh, the one point of view that they're properly educated, we need to make sure that jobs, the jobs there for them, we need to make sure that they can create their own jobs. The good news actually on the jobs front is we started to look at the growth of a labor force relative to the growth of the stable jobs. And for the first time, we're seeing stable jobs grow faster than the labor force. It's early days, right? The labor force is now growing about 2.8%, stable jobs at 3.8%. Uh, we still need a lot faster growth, but there's good signs uh, in that direction. Manufacturing, we've heard the theme over and over again, Mr. Manuel, and it is desperately needed in terms of furthering industrialization and growing the African continent from a GDP perspective. <coughs> Given the current environment, how realistic is it that we're going to be able to shoot the lights out? I think that, the <coughs> that Africa doesn't have a choice in this matter. The report is very clear about the fastest sectors being in the services uh, industry. <coughs> I mean, traditionally, we've also been the exporters of, of raw materials. Um, Aliko Dongoti was speaking about the fact that there needs to be a new uh, approach. It brings together government and, and the private sector to look at these issues. One of the, the elements that I think the report could have uh, uh, elaborated differently is the role of small, medium, and micro enterprises. Fundamentally important. So yes, it's good that we have 700 companies. Uh, with uh, uh, revenues of more than 500 million and 400 with revenues of more than a billion a year. But it's, it's in the SMME sector where the bulk of jobs will be created. And so 
you know, the interaction between those, because the, the auto companies, uh, Bob spoke about VW in, in Kenya, they need uh, componentry manufacture, and that's, it's, it's bringing these issues together in a way that, that creates these, these, these opportunities. But it does mean that governments must actually approach these matters quite differently. Uh, support for businesses and support to build the talent to ensure that businesses will flourish. And I think in many ways, what African leaders have as a responsibility is to win back uh, Africans from the diaspora. I'm, back, I'm glad Andrew's back, for instance, and there are many others out there who need to be won back because, uh, you know, there's, a, there's been a big investment in the talent, but many, sometimes under harsh conditions, we see them crossing the Mediterranean, uh, risking life and limb, uh, but w we, it, it, it is a call to leadership, and I think that's what the focus of the report is, and it needs to be amplified somewhat. Charles, let's uh, get back to a West African perspective, and more importantly, a banking perspective, given the stated withdrawal of Barclays from the African context. Does that present local banks with an opportunity? How is it impacting the banking opportunity? Well, um, when you look at the banking industry um, in Africa, and particularly in West Africa, uh, what we've seen the recent uh, crisis doing is a sharp increase in uh, uh, non-performing loans uh, you know, over the continent. And if you take countries like Nigeria or even Ghana, the level of uh, such non-performing loans has uh, you know, uh, gone way above 10 percent and in some instances even close to 20 percent. That sends a signal that um, companies are, are weakening, that they are facing challenges to um, repay uh, their debt and their obligations. And that also puts a lot of pressure on the banks themselves in terms of the need for them to be uh, properly capitalized to absorb the shocks that you know, come along with uh, uh, such pressures. On the other hand, obviously, um, the fact that uh, some of the uh, banks are now looking at uh, Africa as, let me say it, a riskier country also offers opportunities for local banks and regional banks to also take um, you know, uh, stronger positions. And what we've seen over the last two or three years is uh, a lot of uh, banks going beyond their borders and uh, taking um, a clearly Pan-African view to their growth and development. Uh, we've seen this with a lot of Moroccan banks coming uh, south and taking positions uh, in West and Central Africa. And we've also seen this uh, through uh, Nigerian banks uh, uh, also taking positions uh, in Eastern Africa and also in West Africa. I guess that trend is going to continue. And that also uh, tells us um, how important is um, integration uh, in, in Africa to um, you know, the uh, growth prospects of the continent as uh, the more the continent will be integrated, the more it will rely on itself uh, for its growth and development over the next few years. Well, we're taking a short break, and when we're back, we will continue with the discussion, Lions on the Move 2, realising the potential of Africa's economy. We'll also get questions from our studio audience. Technology space and what Welcome back. Still with me in studio, Archer Leke, who's the senior partner at McKinsey & Company. Trevor Manuel, former South African finance minister, 
Vera Songwe, who's IFC Director for West and Central Africa. Andrew Darfour, Group CEO of Alexander Forbes. And in the Lego studio, we are still joined by Charles Key, Managing Director and CEO of EcoBank Nigeria. Another element that came through strongly in the McKinsey report, Vera, is urbanization and the fact that Africa is urbanizing faster than any other region globally. Perhaps you can weigh in from an economist's perspective. I think uh, uh, what we see is Africa will be producing, 24 million people will be moving to the cities between now and 2025 in Africa. This is going to be the largest movement, more than China where we have 9 million or India where you have 7 million people. As people move to the cities, productivity increases by definition. But what we have is for that productivity to increase, you need some of the basic services for that, transportation, energy. Only 68% of Africa's urban population has access to electricity. So what, what we will need is to make sure that as this urbanization happens, we can accompany with productivity increasing services that help and enable that to happen. The other big issue about around urbanization, which is a good opportunity, is the housing. The report talks about 23 million units needed just in Egypt, Nigeria, and South Africa to start with. With that is going to come the need for manufacturing of metals, plastics, which is, again, the report identifies as another big segment for manufacturing on the continent. So this, the whole urbanization trend on the continent right now will be a source for huge productivity increase, if it huge is executed manufacturing, correctly, if it is executed add that as a with caveat. governments, exactly. Andrew, let me bring you in. Uh, Vera touches on electricity. <coughs> Without electricity, we cannot <coughs> manufacture. Without electricity, we cannot charge the technology to educate our children. What are we doing when it comes to business and governments working together to make sure that the half of the African population that does not have access to electricity, that is 645 million people, mm. will be able to participate in the broader economy? Well, that's the conundrum. I mean, Africa has got this far um, without really having access to power. Um, I think if you think of the GDP growth over the last recent years, it's been very impressive without access to power. So I, I humbly put forward a thesis that if you had power, you could really drive that GDP to double digits on a consistent basis. So the question really has to be, you know, what kinds of investments are being made by business to, in, to encourage power? I think you know, in South Africa, there is clearly a challenge in terms of power for the, the broader population. But I really think it's a, it's a conversation um, between business and government to be very clear. But to me, it comes down to what's the framework, what's the governance, are you having these honest conversations? But also, let's think about it not as one country, think about it as a pool of countries. So I think there have been many forums um, over the recent years where you're bringing people together to say, look, how can we debate on this issue? How do we have consistency of this issue? But I, again, I put forward the thesis that with power, Africa will be so much better. Can, can, I, just, yes, of can course. I just come in? You see, what we're talking of on both infrastructure uh, or urbanization and, and power is that we need a much bigger drive for infrastructure. And if we want that, it's also going to be important to mobilize our resources. Uh, and so the report does, does allude to the power of uh, contractual savings like uh, uh, insurance and, and assurance as a fundamentally important part of our, our future equation. Um, you know, it also will assist us in developing capital markets and, and creating new opportunities on the African continent. So I think that we need to look at all of these issues together. The challenge of urbanization, if you want the agglomeration effect, uh, you can't just have people moving into urban areas, higgledy piggledy adding on to little squares of land where expats used to live, we actually must take a new approach to urbanization. Again, I go back to, to Ethiopia as an example. And Addis has shown what, what is possible when you drive a hard bargain because they brought together uh, public transport, including light rail. They, they bring in a uh, new housing program uh, and, and the overall systems and support services. Uh, and I think that, that that for us becomes a model of what is possible. And in every country, we'll find that these large slums can be tackled by proper housing, infrastructure, public transport, water, energy, and so on. And if we start there, I think that we'll also see the significant boost 
to employment creation as we tackle those issues, but it does recall, uh, require strong leadership. One of the problems that, that leaders in Africa, uh, uh, there, there, there's a kind of failing that, that leaders have. <coughs> we always talk about rural development because the television cameras don't go there. But there's no rural development taking place, but there's no urban development either. So, you know, there's, there's, a, there's this, this, this notion that you're sacrificing urban development in the interest of rural areas, but there's too little focus on infrastructure development and the built environment. I want to come continent. back to the leadership issue, but let's stay with manufacturing yeah. for a moment. There's a very nice stat by the World Bank that every 10% increase in your infrastructure uh, assets mm -hmm. basically relates to a 1% direct increase in GDP right. on the continent. Let's come back there, Acha, and then we'll come back to yeah. the right leadership. So, so it's very clear that you know infrastructure is critical for the continent, right? And I agree with everybody and what you said on power as you know, as one asset class is absolutely critical. The good news and building on what Andrew was saying is we're seeing a lot of momentum, right? So you've seen now the African Development Bank with the New Deal and Energy taking the lead and saying it's also important for us as Africans to lead and own this, pulling all the parties together. Power Africa is very active. Diffid is very active. But at least for now, we're saying, you know, we're coming together and saying we need to address this. It's a huge priority. And we're starting to see some, some uptick. You see what Kenya has done on, on the transmission and distribution front over the last five years. You're starting to see a lot of new technologies, for example, what MCOPA is doing on the solar front. So there's a lot of new technologies, many grids that are helping us address it. And I'm actually quite positive uh, that, that we will, you know, we'll see this trend continue over the next few years on the power front. There. I just wanted to add on that front. We at the IFC, for example, have seen this year, uh, uh, 2015, has been our highest year in infrastructure development on the continent financing, which gives a, the, the important part of that is the public-private angle. And I think, as Acha was saying... Which leads to innovative financing exactly, models. Exactly, exactly. And we're, we're doing that with uh, scaling solar. I think the three issues that we need to look at is the bankability of projects, and we're working on that, trying to see how we can work with governments to build and generate a pipeline. Secondly, how you fund and finance them. So there's a whole s instrument that uh, body of instruments we've developed, both with the World Bank and the mega and guarantees to deal with the exchange rate issues, but then also the risk issues, especially because you have exchange rates. And then you have a whole procurement issues, just how do you procure? And many more countries are moving to independent power producers and public-private uh, arrangements. Cote d'Ivoire, Cameroon, Senegal, Nigeria now with the Azure. Uh, 459 megawatts last year. So I think there is a move towards the, the understanding that the private sector can finance energy if you put in place the right model, the right procurement structure, and the speed with which you can do it. If you add to that the fact that we have now no new low cost, as Acha said, scaling solar, we have hydro across the continent that is being developed and developed well, which will create cheaper energy. That is a big part of the competitiveness of the, of the country. And I think that uh, the continent, and Acha spoke about 33 billion being spent in, in 2015. We need 55 billion in 2025 to get to where we need to. When you add the energy and the infrastructure, 150 billion, I think that the GDP of the continent will clearly go into double, double digits, at least in the 44 countries that are growing today. Mr. Manuel, it looks as though you want to add on that note. No, I'm actually very positive because the message is coming from a number of different places. The President Adesina of the African Development Bank has a very strong campaign for the high fives. Light up and power Africa. And power I'm Africa. way behind <laughs> that one. <laughs> Feed <laughs> Africa, <laughs> industrialize Africa, Africa in, in the, uh, integrate Africa, and then improve uh, the quality of life. Improve mm -hmm. on the quality of life. If we get those things right, we get the focus right, we get it into leaders' heads, then I think we're going we're gonna to drive this, this, this program in a big way. We're now going to get some commentary from our studio audience, and beginning with George, George DeVoe, who's managing partner, Africa for McKinsey. George, you've spent some time in China, and perhaps what is pertinent for our discussion is the lessons that Africa can draw from China's growth story. So um, thank you very much for uh, inviting me. Uh, I find very striking when I observe um, the, uh, particularly the urban uh, centers in Africa, how that reminds me of um, China, you know, 15, 20 years ago. And uh, when you observe it from both the macroeconomic elements, but also the way that people live and on the field, 
uh, you realize that the same uh, momentum of uh, economic development uh, is likely to happen. And, and you know, I think it will take time, as many people mentioned, but I think there. What's different, I think, in a positive sense uh, from China is a couple of things that I think uh, strike me. Um, one is the technology-based innovation that ex is here. It was not at the time in China. We talk about uh, Baidu, Tencent, uh, Alibaba. They didn't exist at the time. They exist in, in, in some way, shape, or form in Africa, and that should help Africa actually leapfrog in that sense. And the second thing is the leadership. Uh, you know, I know there is a, it's a challenge, but at the same time, I think the leadership in Africa strikes me as, you know, very well, uh, you know, aware of where the um, uh, continent needs to go. And I think that's two assets that I think sometimes people might underestimate about Africa. Yvonne, let's also get your, your comments, obviously, an economist at Renaissance Capital. Just on the conversation that has taken place to this point, what really strikes you as most important? Um, thank you for the invitation and us as Renaissance Capitals, you know, I've always been Africa optimist, so we uh, agree with the many of the points on the report. There's just one area I'd wanted to add and I think is something that um, a lot of our clients would like to see further gains on is institutions and the view is that if we continue to see institutions strengthening on the continent, then we'll sustain the democratic gains we've seen on the continent. And most importantly, we'll continue uh, to get more accountable leadership that will deliver on all uh, the pledges or, or what we've discussed today, including um, diversifying our economies, uh, delivering on health care and education to the youth uh, that's growing on uh, uh, the continent. So um, I think that's probably one area that we'd like to see more on, if, as long as we have the right leadership on the continent and the institutions that will allow us to vote them out if they're not delivering, then I think we'll continue to see the gains we have seen since the beginning of this millennium uh, that we've spoken to today. Uh, Charles, let's come back to you in Lagos and th on that point and the, the strength of institutions. Can we get a West African perspective from you? Uh, yes, I think um, one of the, uh, the, the key indicators that we need to look into when you look at West Africa in particular is the very low level of intra-African trade. Uh, if I take two large countries in, uh, in, Af in West Africa, Nigeria and Cote d'Ivoire, today it's uh, quite striking that um, less than you know, three, five percent of the export of each of the countries go to each other. Um, what this tells us is that there is more that can be done in uh, integrating African countries uh, from an economic perspective and particularly from a trade perspective. And one of the ways to actually improve that is to ensure that the level of infrastructure that is needed to facilitate you know, transportation uh, and uh, movement of goods and services uh, you know, between countries uh, are actually in place. So we can't um, uh, emphasize more uh, the need for African countries to invest in infrastructure. I mean, it's clear that more than 100 or $150 billion need to be invested every single year for the next uh, few years uh, to bridge the, the infrastructure gap. Uh, we can't emphasize more the need for uh, education to be a priority, uh, particularly in the light of the tremendous technological changes that we're seeing uh, across the continent, and particularly in the financial services industry, where today uh, payments are now almost all going electronic, and also where we've seen literally a doubling of e-commerce transactions uh, in, country like, in countries like Nigeria and Ghana. So uh, more needs to be done from an institutional perspective to facilitate and, uh, and strengthen education, infrastructure, uh, and integration. Well, there we go, picking up on institutions, but also putting infrastructure and education at the top of the agenda. Any further questions from our studio audience that we have present here today? Uh, while you are gathering your thoughts for additional questions, we are encouraging that interactivity. I'm going to come back to my panel. Leadership has come through as a theme over and over again throughout this discussion. Actually, your thoughts on the context of African leadership right now. And, and perhaps the broad question is, do we have the right leadership in place 
to take us to the next stage? So, you know, uh, the, the answer is leadership has improved across the continent. It's very clear if we look at the leadership today, and we do a lot of public sector work, working with many of these leaders across the continent, as McKinsey. You see a step change in, in you know, where we are today relative to where we were 10 years ago. But we're still not where we need to be, right? So we've talked about how the, the, you know, the leaders, we need to make sure there's a lot more execution. I think we have leaders who you know, have visions and know what they want to do, but we're really struggling on the public sector front. And in many cases on the private sector front, we're actually executing uh, on, uh, on this. So we also have some leaders who are not doing the right thing for the countries. We want to have, make sure we have more leaders who are accountable uh, to Yvonne's point. And, you know, and if they're not and not delivering, institutions that can help us you know, choose the right set of leaders. But again, the good news is I think we're absolutely going in the right direction, and, uh, but more needs to be done. So, Mr. Manuel, I take comfort from the fact that we all managed to quote the high fives from the African Development Bank. <laughs> so, President Adeshina <laughs> is certainly making inroads in terms of, of communication. Now, it's all about that execution. It's all about the execution. I mean, <clears throat> I hear what people say about leadership, but we have had a stronger agglomeration of leadership at various points. I think back to those who drove the change from the OAU to the AU to the African peer review mechanism to the introduction of NEPAD. Um, and I think it's very important that we, we go back to that system. It's part of our lived experience to remind ourselves of what leaders are capable of and to drive this a very hard bargain. Because <coughs> as, as, as time progresses, I think we need leadership that's uh, a lot more nuanced than what you have at the moment. Uh, in, in respect of integration, the example uh, of, of what gets manufactured and what gets traded and why the ratios of intra-African trade are as low is because leaders don't sit down in the regional economic communities and try and develop perspectives on this. Now, I'm, I'm very mindful of the fact that you can't always choose what FDI you want. But if we had more domestic resources adequately mobilized, then I think we could engage with the private sector quite differently. And I go back to the example I raised earlier of Ethiopia. If you look at the uh, development of sectors, uh, like clothing, textiles, and leather, for example, uh, these are lead sectors, but uh, uh, they, they are an indication of what's possible. If you look at China right now, one of the issues that, that, that is reality in China is that um, manufacturing is becoming expensive ev even in China. So the opportunities are there, but we need to sequence the decisions. And you're not going to be able to develop this without uh, infrastructure. You need the roads, you need the urban infrastructure, certainly you need power and water and a range of other issues. All of this, as we begin to deal with this country by country, we also then unlock the agricultural potential. It, there's no point in claiming the 60% if we can't get inputs in and product to market, if we can't develop cold storage for fresh produce, these are the kinds of issues that now become important. And I think that, uh, you know, the fact that the African Development Bank is speaking as strongly as it is, the fact that the AU is uh, uh, populating the Africa 2063 vision, uh, but leaders must actually be held accountable, we must hold their feet to the fire and ensure that we can drive these changes together. Does the report drill down into the agriculture opportunity? You, you have alluded to yes. available cropland mm. in your initial points. Exactly. But we've now got to move that, as Mr. Manuel is saying, from uh, sustainable sustenance farming through to the, the supply chain that Mr. Manuel's referred to. So as a report in this one, no, it doesn't. And not that it's not important. We just have to make a call. And in this case, we so the stat is there from the, the cropland perspective. The stat is there, exactly. And, and you know, there's a lot, again, on the agriculture front. There's a lot of work that has been done. The Agra forum was, uh, happened last week, as we know, in Nairobi. So a lot of governments are pushing on that front. That creates a number of jobs in the private sector, creating special economic zones like actually Minister Adesina, President Adesina did when he was Minister in Nigeria. So that a lot of action is going there, but we still, again, it's one of those sectors that we would argue, and we've shown in the, in the report, has still underperformed, and we need a lot more action there. But can I just get in a little point, uh, just to amplify what Bob Collymore said? It's about agribusiness. Mm -hmm. It's about understanding what world trends are, and the potential of Africa to produce not just for ourselves, ensuring that everybody has food security, but also the export potential of the agriculture. The export potential, segment. absolutely. The beneficiation of those agriculture mm -hmm. products, another way to put it. 
let's get your thoughts here, Andrew, in terms of the support that private sector is giving to agribusiness, or is that all just talk at this stage? I think the only way to answer that question to say is, is it's a C score and a report card. More could be done, um, but it must be a, an imperative to move forward. Um, if I may just pick up on some of the themes that we talked about earlier, I think Africans have got to want to help Africans succeed. So no one's going to do this. So you know, it's not going to be you know, the US or Europe or Asia that will make Africa great. It's got to be African. So I think there's got to be an internal belief that we've got to do this and we've got to do this together. So it starts off with a desire, a hunger. And I think over the last 10 years, you've really seen people starting to have these really good conversations around this. That's very important because without people wanting this to happen, it won't happen. Vera, you wanted to, to come in on that point. It, one of the things that the report talks about is agro-processing and agribusiness as almost the next step to manufacturing, and that's how we go from the uh, uh, 500 to the 900 billion. And I think a big chunk of that in the agro-processing, and I give an example, we at IFC, for example, are working with Cargill in Cameroon, 100 cooperatives, 7,000 uh, uh, farmers, trying to finance them through the financial sector using this innovative technology. And I think I want to come back on this idea of innovation. One of the big drivers of growth is the innovation that comes out of the continent. And agribusiness and agro-processing is, I think, one of the biggest nodes where we can find that in the packaging, because we do have the plastics and we can do that. And I think we begin to see, and the report talks about that, the fact that the big conglomerates on the continent are now moving. We have businesses going from Senegal to, to Cote d'Ivoire in the packaging sector in agribusiness. We have Kirien, the water sector. And we're financing more and more of, of, of the packaging and the agro-processing with urbanization and increased incomes. We will need to continue to feed ourselves. And I think there is a huge business opportunity there, $122 billion, huge, uh, and the private sector is coming into that. So my sense is the government is, and we talk linking that to leadership, there is beginning to be increased leadership on land issues. It's a difficult issue, but I think many countries are reviewing and revising their laws on leasing of land. Owning of land on the continent remains a big issue and it will not happen. But I think that our leaders are taking that into account and looking at frameworks for leasing that makes it possible for institutions to come in and facilitate cooperatives that will actually make way. Yeah, two additional thoughts on that uh, and I totally agree you know agro-processing is critical and that's actually one sector we looked at the reality is today we import a third of the food and beverages we consume across Africa right if you look at ASEAN or Mercosur they import only 10 to 15 percent right so there's a huge opportunity for us in addition to export just to produce more for our local consumption so that's one critical point the second we sort of alluded to but I thought it was critical to bring it up is education Right, education in Africa is still uh, uh, hugely underdeveloped. There's a lot we need to do there. Where we believe, and we looked at it, we did a South Africa report last year, as you know, we did a Niger report two years ago, and it's very clear today the 50 million Africans who graduate from high school every year, the university slots for, I won't ask you the question, but I'll tell you, six million of them. Only six, right? This is an interesting <laughs> tactic you use where you start <laughs> asking the moderator right, questions. Right. So you don't want to hand it to me. The university is lost for six million, right? And so, you know, we need to significantly increase that. Um, but we believe vocational training is also the way to go, right? We look at the jobs that are needed. A lot of them are entry-level jobs for which we need to, uh, we need vocational training to account for about half of the, of the educational output we think in many of our countries. We have five minutes left of this discussion and I'm going to ask our panelists to give their concluding statements again taking into the context of lions on the move to realizing the potential of Africa's economies and may I re remind my panelists there are five of you five it uh, means that we've got one minute each for those concluding comments I'm coming to Lagos and Charles if you could begin concluding comments sir. Okay. Now, I think, um, uh, you know, the perspective of growth in Africa remain quite strong. And, and again, if I look at this from, a, from the perspective of, of West Africa, where, where I am, in particular in Nigeria, where I, where I live, uh, despite the challenges that we've seen recently, um, you just have to think about the population that we have in these countries. You just have to think about the youth. You just have to think about the tremendous changes that we're seeing in the uh, technology landscape. To think that um, clearly um, Africa is on the right path. And now more than ever, we need to make sure that the potential we've talked about for so long now finally materializes and, trans and translates into real growth 
for the countries and for the whole continent. And that actually uh, ensures that in the next few years, uh, Africa becomes one of the leading uh, continent uh, at the scale of the world. Andrew, I'm going to ask you to follow. Sure. Um, I'm very optimistic about the future of Africa, but I think you've got to take a long-term view. Um, there will be bumps on the road, but I really think the destiny of Africa is in the hands of Africans. This could be an incredible success or not. So it's what we do together. Vera. I think uh, 2000 to 2010, showed the potential that we had been talking about for so long. 2010 to 2015 showed that Africa is resilient. And I think from 2016 going forward, as the report says, growth would reignite because again, I believe that the fundamentals are strong and we can get back to where we were in 2010 to 2000, uh, 2000 to 2010. <coughs> Mr. Manuel. <coughs> Bronwyn, what the report does is to show what is possible. But there's no automaticity. It needs to be driven, uh, and I think the discussion this morning allowed us to draw all of the strands together about what needs to be done. Uh, and, and epicentral to that is the quality of leadership, and one of the, the clear dimensions of that leadership is the ability to invigorate energy in the private sector and to grow uh, the, econo the, the African economies uh, bit by bit. But I think it's... <coughs> excuse me very important to say to leaders across the continent, both in the private sector and the public sector, that there's no place to hide. We know what is possible. We know that we must do it. And we know that the opportunities, including the demographic dividend, will not be yielded if and, uh, of themselves uh, we need to create those opportunities differently. And of course, you remind us that when we talk leadership, it is both public and private mm -hmm. sector. Yeah. Acha. Final uh, statement to you, sir. Uh, I'll conclude with exactly how we conclude in the report, which is the Lions are still on the move, uh, but they do need to improve the fitness, both on the corporate side, but of course, more importantly, like Mr. Emmanuel said, on the, on the government side, on the public sector side, in order to sustain and accelerate this growth. And I think let's use that as our concluding okay. comment. The Lions are still on the move. Thank you so much for joining us for this discussion. I think a round of applause is in order for our great panelists. <coughs> Thank you very much for the interaction from our studio audience as well. Again, uh, I was joined by Achaleke, senior partner at McKinsey and Company, Trevor Manuel, former South African finance minister, Vera Songwe, IFC director for West and Central Africa, Andrew Darfo, group CEO of Alexander Forbes, and in the Lagos studio, we were joined by Charles Key, managing director and CEO of EcoBank Nigeria. Thank you for joining us.